Welcome to Silicon Bytes episode 45. I've had to change the title and running order of this episode several times because of the sheer amount of news that is piling up. We won't even touch upon Iran and what has happened there in this episode. There simply isn't time. And as you can see from the title of the video, it's all about stuff on fire, stuff going boom in Russia. And again, there is a huge amount of this happening. Ukrainian drones hit military facilities in Russia and Crimea amid Russian claims that it has downed over a hundred Ukrainian drones. Of course, we have to take those claims with a huge pinch of salt. And here is a rundown of key events over the last couple of days. Ukrainian drones hit military facilities inside Russia and Crimea. Zelensky has said that Russia's Kharkiv offensive has halted, or the advance has been halted, 10 kilometers into the country and at the first significant line of Ukrainian defense. Zelensky has signed into law amendments increasing the fines for draft evaders and allowing some convicts to serve in the military. And police have also said that Russia are using civilians in Vovachansk as part of their Kharkiv offensive as human shields. Ukrainian drones have attacked several military facilities in Russia and occupied Crimea. This took place on the evening of May the 17th. This comes from a source from the security services of Ukraine, the SBU, and apparently it was a joint operation carried out by the SBU and Ukraine's military intelligence. And I think it's interesting, so many of these attacks are getting through, so many attacks on oil refining capacity, which we'll come to in a minute, it is suggesting that Russia's vast, vast territory, which it sees as a strength, may actually be a strategic weakness in the era of massed drone assaults. And in some ways, it's impossible to protect all of its industrial facilities and all of its sprawling territory. Drones have also targeted the Russian Black Sea fleet located in occupied Sevastopol and significantly the Russian city of Novorossiysk in the Krasnodar Krai. And there are some extraordinary videos out there from the weekend of multiple Ukrainian drones flying towards their targets and, of course, the shocked commentary, as usual, full of expletives of Russians who are observing this unfold. This attack by Ukraine also impacted a power plant near Sevastopol, leading to power outages. And this is significant because the port of Novorossiysk is where Russia began redeploying its Black Sea fleet after a series of devastating Ukrainian strikes, including a missile strike on its headquarters in Sevastopol in September 2023. And I'm sure everyone will remember the extraordinary footage of those strikes. Now, just because Russian troops have been stopped 10 kilometers or so into the territory, that does not mean that the town of Vovachansk is not being hit hard. It is, of course, in the absolute firing line, and it is well on the way to being turned into another Bakhmut, with Russia trying to level as much of the town as possible. Ukraine has reinforced several sectors, reports the Kiev Independent, with battalions that could be taken somewhere from the reserves and from other sectors. Russian troops managed to cross the border partially, it's been claimed, because of Ukraine's lack of air defence systems. And of course, it must be stated because of their lack of air capability as well. This, of course, is very much the fault of the West, for slow walking the supply of F-16s and their reluctance to give Ukraine the equipment it needs to gain air superiority over its own sovereign territories. And the horror from Russia continues. Russia has carried out a double tap strike north of Kharkiv, killing six, and that includes 
a pregnant woman. Russian troops attacked a recreation center in a northern suburb of Kharkiv at around 11 a.m. local time on May the 19th, killing six civilians, including a pregnant woman, and wounding 27. Russian troops attacked an area where local residents were resting, according to the local governor. And the double tap nature of the strike tells you everything you need to know about Russia, its tactics, the total impunity with which it operates, and the absence of any morality or values at all. In the double tap, a paramedic was among the wounded and an ambulance was damaged, added the governor. Double taps are a common Russian tactic in which a target is struck once, and then again shortly afterwards, the second strike deliberately targets rescue workers. It's a morally bankrupt terror tactic. It's the tactic of a terrorist regime, which is what Russia has become. And this is what Ukraine is fighting against. And here's an interesting statement in the Kiev Independent by the UK Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. And this is extraordinarily outspoken, unusually plain and frank, not only for a British politician, but for any politician who is really addressing this statement, not at Ukraine. He's addressing it at allies, the US and Berlin as well. The West's stance, says the Defence Secretary, on the Ukraine war is completely nonsensical. In an interview with Sky News, Grant Shapps was asked about comments he made earlier this week by President Volodymyr Zelensky, who said that Ukraine's international partners are afraid of Russia losing the war and would like Kiev to win in such a way that Russia does not lose. The Defence Secretary was asked whether the West was, through its strategy, through its lack of strategy, in fact, creating a stalemate in the war with Russia, in which tens of thousands of people are dying needlessly. This is a wake-up moment for the West, said Grant Shapps, and that by delaying what we should be doing, we're running the risk of doing exactly what President Zelensky is concerned about. I think this is a completely nonsensical way for the West to support Ukraine. We have to understand that we are in an existential battle about the way we run the world order and about democracy itself. And these are incredibly important words. It's heartening to hear them. And of course, it needs to be followed up with action. And here, Grant Shapps is equally clear about what action needs to be taken. And I have to say, this is something we've been talking about on this channel for the last two years and are still waiting for it to happen. He said, I don't think war works this way. He said, for Ukraine to win, we need to be giving them everything that they need in order to win. Drip feeding, hustling out different types of support, different munitions, capabilities, training. This is not the way to support Ukrainian resilience. This is not the way to win such a war against such a relentless and brutal opponent as Russia. In addition to this, the UK Defence Secretary has been quoted as calling on Germany to provide Ukraine with long-range missiles. You can be sure that these debates have been happening behind the scenes, and I'm sure they have been very vocal. They are now becoming public as well, because it's clear that Germany's Chancellor Scholz is resisting all calls, both from outside the country and even from within the country, to provide these essential munitions to Ukraine to help them win. It is not exactly clear why he's doing this. I think some people in the German political establishment now are not understanding his motivations either, but it's not clear how the blockage of Schultz is to be cleared out of the way. Ukraine has received other classifications, other types of long-range missiles, such as Storm Shadow from the UK, the French-made Scalp, and now it is receiving long-range attackums as well. None of these things have triggered World War III. None of these things have triggered a nuclear response by Russia. They have been shown that Russia's threats are empty, 
are hollow and they are the threat of a terroristic bully. Why then is the German Chancellor still so afraid of Russia? German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is against sending long-range missiles to Ukraine, as apparently he fears this will risk Berlin getting involved in the war, inverted commas, according to Bild, based on unnamed German and Ukrainian sources. Chaps retorted to this, what I would like to see are all of our partners, including Germany, who do have the facility to provide these long-range weapons, but do not allow them to be used in Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, changing their tune. I think all these things need to happen. And of course, as most people on this channel would agree, they need to happen fast. And just to fill in some detail about those attacks on Novorossiysk, video footage, as I said, has emerged of missiles striking the port and causing fires to break out. According to locals, the attack also hit the city's oil infrastructure. The Novorossiysk fuel oil terminal and the Transneft terminal were attacked. There were also reportedly power losses too. And in addition, we continue to see strikes against Russian fuel refining targets. Kiev says these attacks are carried out to undermine Russia's military operations and retaliate against Moscow's strikes on Ukrainian energy infrastructure. But these aren't just revenge attacks. These are perhaps one of the most strategic and effective things Ukraine can do. And it is starting to have a significant effect on the Russian economy and on Russia's ability to sustain its war machine. We'll be tackling this topic in more detail in interviews coming up through the week. And in addition to drones and attackums and other munitions, Ukraine also has another option in its armory, and this is the use of partisans. And this article from the Kiev Independent describes how an ammunition depot was hit at Bilbek airfield in occupied Crimea, and it's suspected that partisans were involved in this attack. The main missile and artillery depot of the Russian Belbek military airfield near occupied Sevastopol was damaged on the evening of May the 15th, according to a partisan group, Atesh. The Crimean Wind Telegram channel claimed earlier that the airfield was attacked and a fuel depot caught fire as a result of the strike. Eyewitnesses have seemingly corroborated these claims. Explosions were reported in occupied Sebastopol, Simferopol, Jankoy, and Khvardiske. The partisans claimed that the damaged depot stored many missiles for Russia's Su-29 and Su-30 fighter jets, as well as MiG-31 aircraft. A carrier of Kinjal ballistic missiles that Russia uses to attack Ukraine, apparently, was also hit. And it also seems that Ukrainian air defences are once more improving. There has been during the ammunition famine, which also was an air defence famine, the ratio of hits really went down dramatically, in some instances to below 50%, whereas previously it had been up in the 80s and 90%. Well, this weekend it has been reported that Ukraine downed all 20 Russian drones overnight, Shahid-type drones which launched an attack on May the 17th. The drones were reportedly launched from the Russian port town of Primorska Ahatsk, located on the coast of the Sea of Azov. Aircraft, missile and electronic warfare units and mobile fire groups of the Ukrainian Air Force intercepted the drones over Kharkiv, Poltava, Finitsia, Odessa and Mikhailov oblasts. So we can see the scale of these attacks is huge, but taking them out is incredibly important to saving Ukrainian infrastructure and saving Ukrainian lives. And in connection with this story, which is relatively positive, we also have a report that quotes Zelensky that there have been no reports of artillery shortages for the first time in the full-scale war. That is, the first time since the launch of Russia's full-scale invasion, no Ukrainian brigades have reported a lack of artillery shells. Volodymyr Zelensky announced this to reporters on May the 16th. This has been changing 
over the last two months, he said, changing for a position of famine and shortage and limiting Ukraine's capabilities and unfortunately causing more casualties than really were necessary if they'd been fully armed. But he said there is still a lot of work to do to make sure that the famine or critical shortage of artillery shells does not return to some areas. In January, Defence Minister Rustem Umirov said Ukraine was unable to fire more than 2,000 shells per day. That is around a third of Russia's average daily shell usage. But the Czech-led initiative to buy artillery shells for Ukraine identified 500,000 155mm shells and 300,000 122mm shells outside Europe that could be brought. It is suspected that some of this is starting to hit Ukrainian supplies arriving uh, in bulk. And of course, there is the USA package, which has also unlocked sources of shells that are now being distributed to the front. At the same time, Russia has increased its military production capacity and is likely already able to produce a million shells a year. And as we know, it is also getting supplies from North Korea. North Korea is retooling its economy in order to supply the Russian war effort. And this retooling of economies towards total war is an important subject. We'll be tackling it in more detail in a conversation with Konstantin Samailov, and we'll be tackling this in more detail in the next Silicon Bytes as well. But here is a briefly to touch upon that story, uh, because we know there was a reshuffle in the government in Moscow, some significant changes, and Putin appointed as the new defense minister, Bill Ulsov. He is not someone with any military experience at all, but what he can potentially do is help put Russia's economy onto a war footing. Russian President Vladimir Putin's appointment of a new defense minister, Andrei Belosov, is seen as an attempt to streamline Russia's economy and mobilize it for the war effort. Russia's military has faced numerous supply and logistical problems that thwarted its all-out war against Ukraine right from the start. The problems of poor logistics and lack of strategic planning also persist to this day. Putin must be hoping that they will be solved by this appointment and by shuffling Shoigu sideways. Belosov was Russia's economy minister from 2012 to 13 and an aide to Putin from 2013 to 2020. So the question here is, has he been appointed for his competence or for his loyalty? It is likely that loyalty still comes first in the paranoid, fevered atmosphere of Moscow in the wake of Prigozhin's coup last year, or mutiny, as it's more commonly called by experts. Putin would not challenge anyone who represents a threat to his power base. So first of all, Belosov has been chosen because of his loyalty to the Kremlin and to Putin individually. Secondly, he is a technocrat. He is apparently a maths whiz, but someone who is more attuned to a command economy than a free market economy. And this tells us the direction of travel. Putin will be gradually turning his entire economy into more of a war communism style society. More and more private business will come under the control of the state and more and more of the country's assets and resources will be stripped to fuel Putin's pointless war. But more of that analysis in the next episode. Nova Gazeta adds some detail to this in an article it calls Snakes and Adders, and it discusses the fact that powerful groups within the Russian elite are increasingly breaking the unspoken rule against public infighting. The arrest last month of Deputy Defence Minister Timur Ivanov for allegedly accepting a bribe, which of course is nonsensical because the entire system is corrupt, ominously defied rules that have been put in place, unspoken rules for the last couple of years, that these kind of fights happen outside of the public 
sphere. But these deepening tensions amongst powerful groups in Russia, amid a lack of coherent leadership, are becoming more and more visible. Make no mistake, however, the article says, Putin has no serious challenges. And of course, a lot of his effort is expended to make sure that no one actually rises up to become a challenger. That may be one of the reasons why Patrushev has been removed from this powerful position and clearly given a far less significant and influential role. But while Putin is top of the pile in Russia still, it seems that he is becoming very much the junior partner in Russia's relationship with China. Here is an interesting article from the Kiev Post, which quotes Putin as saying, it's going quite well, Putin says to Xi about the Ukraine war. Well, of course, we are in our third year. Russia is soon to lose up to half a million troops, has gained relatively little ground compared to what it already possessed prior to full-scale war. The idea that this is going well seems a touch absurd. But the question is, is the war going well for China? Has the weakening of Russia allowed China to become the senior partner in that relationship? And does it give China access to Russia's resources at a fraction of their market rate. Russian President Vladimir Putin made friendly advances to his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping at the start of his two-day state visit to Beijing on Thursday. The Russian autocrat described the progress of his invasion of Ukraine, saying it's underway in all directions and is going quite well. Putin promised to give Xi a battlefield update in private. Well, does Putin actually know what is taking place on the battlefield? This is a question we cannot properly answer. Putin insisted that both countries were working for a multipolar world, inverted commas, rather than one dominated by NATO, and said that many of the two countries' approaches to international policy were similar. But China must be keenly observing the outcome of this war. They may be even trying to put themselves in a win-win scenario, if that's possible. If Russia wins, the concept of worldwide autocracy wins. If Russia loses, China has incredible leverage over whatever remains on Russian territory. And even more ironically, at the end of this summit, they hailed their partnership as a stabilizing force in a chaotic world. You could flip that entirely around. They represent a chaotic and brutal force in what had been a relatively stable world. For those who criticize the American world order, the international rules-based order that the US and its allies have worked so hard to build after the Second World War, to those who criticize that, well, you haven't seen anything yet. Because when autocrats like Xi Jinping, Putin, and the Ayatollahs in Iran hold sway, it will be a world of violence, brutality, and chaos that you can barely imagine. And that brutality is in evidence throughout the battlefield in Ukraine. And here is an interesting article from the Kiev Independent that looks into the role of glide bombs. It asks, why do glide bombs help Russia gain land in Ukraine and what makes them so effective? Well, these have been one of the critical factors in Russia's recent battlefield success, that extensive use of glide bombs. Essentially, these are large, deadly weapons that rain down on Ukraine each one creating a 20 meter wide crater and unfortunately obliterating military positions and entire settlements that they fall on. Russia has come to heavily rely on glide bombs in its new offensive in the Kharkiv Oblast. They have been using them to try and clear the way for their ground troops to make incursions and progress. Several villages and towns we know, including the town of Vovchansk, uh, have been occupied 
and are in the process of being devastated by this Russian weapon. Despite their simplicity and low cost, glide bombs have become one of Russia's most effective weapons at this stage of the full-scale war, and they played a significant role in the fall of Avdivka in February. Experts warn that these bombs could pose an even greater threat to Ukraine because currently there is little defence against them and Russia is expected to continue its mass deployment of glide bombs to support further offensive operations. A glide bomb is a standard airdrop bomb modified to be launched from a distance rather than directly over the target. Glide bombs date back to World War II, with the German Fritz X bomb being the first model. The US later developed and used several types of glide bombs in conflicts in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Russia mainly uses Soviet-era FAB family bombs, upgraded with a unified gliding and correction module, which includes wings that flip out as the weapon is released by an aircraft and a satellite navigation system. Converting a dumb bomb, an unguided one, into a smart one costs around $20,000. That makes this munition class a lot cheaper as an alternative to cruise and ballistic missiles that cost millions of dollars to produce. And of course, as the article points out, Russia has a huge stock of these dumb bombs that it can convert. Now, we mentioned this earlier, but I think this is an important article. A link will appear in the description of the video. And this is the major speech by Zelensky about how Ukraine's partners fear Russia losing the war. We have been saying this on this channel right from the start. And it's important that Zelensky is now voicing openly what many Ukrainians have known almost from the start of the full-scale invasion. In fact, before that, they've known this since 2014 and Russia's first invasion of Crimea and Donbass. He said that Kiev's allies fear Russia's loss in the war against Ukraine because it would involve unpredictable geopolitics. But I don't think it works that way, said Zelensky. For Ukraine to win, we need to be given everything with which we can win, he said. And this again is something we've emphasised. Rather than giving Ukraine less than it needs to win, rather than just giving it what it needs to remain in the fight, we should give Ukraine more than it needs to win and let them choose which munitions to use, where, when and how in order to achieve that victory. Anything else is gambling with lives, gambling with geopolitics, gambling, in fact, at this point with World War Three, because the longer this carries on, the more aggressive, the more ambitious Russia becomes, the more likely it will be that NATO is involved in a hot conflict with Russia in the next months or years. Zelensky also added some common sense to this debate. He said during this same speech, there should be no bans about using Western weapons on the territory of Russia if those weapons are being used to hit Russian military capability only because this is not about Ukrainians using these Western weapons offensively on Russian territory. Ukraine is not seeking to occupy and conquer Russia. It is still about defense. That deployment is still a defensive deployment of weapons because those troops that are on the Russian side of the border, those missile systems, those drone launch sites, they are sending offensive weaponry into Ukraine, killing civilians and prolonging the war. And the situation in Kharkiv remains difficult, but under control, Zelensky has said, adding that Russia has sustained significant losses. Russia launched this new offensive with 30,000 troops on May the 10th, targeting Kharkiv Oblast, which is situated at the two countries' shared border in northern Ukraine. And Putin must have been hoping that somehow 
these troops make enough progress to threaten Kharkiv itself. A city of formerly 1.2 million people, it's Ukraine's second largest city. It seems unrealistic to most of us, and indeed to many Ukrainians I speak to, that Russia could take this entire city. Certainly not in the span of days and weeks. It's taken many, many months to take villages like Uglidar, Solidar, Avdivka, with extraordinary losses of men, munitions, and armored vehicles, taking a vast and sprawling urban area like Kharkiv seems to be at this point impossible, especially given the numbers of troops that Russia has sent in. They seem to be insufficient for the task. And this idea that the Russian advance has been halted is being reported by more and more sources. But that doesn't stop Russia acting like a terrorist and doing terroristic things. This article in the Kyiv Post suggests that Russia is keeping human shields in the border town of Vavchansk. The head of police investigations in Ukraine's northern Kharkiv region reported that 35 to 40 people were being held captive and that Russia was interrogating them, potentially to use them as human shields as Moscow wages its offensive in the north of Ukraine. The Russians kept them in one place, used them as a human shield, as their command headquarters is nearby. We do not have information as to whether there are children among the hostages. There were mainly elderly people who did not want to leave their homes, said Sergei Balvinov. But of course, we know from terrible examples that Russian soldiers have previously been accused of executing civilians in parts of Ukraine they have captured and controlled following the full-scale invasion. That includes civilians in the Kiev suburb of Butcher that was held for more than a month by Russian forces, and many were found with their hands tied behind their backs and shot. There are also reports coming in of civilians having been shot and executed in Vovchansk, but until that territory is liberated, we likely won't know the full story. Now let's have a quick summary of a number of important stories that are breaking as we record this episode. And one of these concerns Georgia. You'll know from the channel that we've been covering the events in Georgia in some depth. And we've tried to get a Georgian speaker on the ground onto the channel at least once a week to give us an update on the situation. Well, currently, as it stands, the Speaker of the Georgian Parliament announces plans to overrule the president's veto of the foreign agent laws. The Speaker of Georgia's Parliament and a member of the ruling Georgian Dream Party announced on May the 20th that the party plans to overrule Georgian President Salome Zorabishvili's veto of the controversial foreign agents law. Georgia's pro-Western president is a political opponent of Georgia Dream, and it's within her powers to veto the law. The trouble is the government has a large enough majority in parliament to counter overrule the law and drive it through the legislature. There are still potential roadblocks in the law's path, namely a possible review by the judiciary. The president has also stated that the law is against Article 78 of Georgia's constitution, which obliges the government to seek Euro-Atlantic integration. But due to the government's control over the judiciary, critics say the likelihood of the courts preventing the law from being enacted is low. And EU officials have been quoted off the record as saying that if the law passes, then Georgia's membership bid to enter the European Union will be frozen. This should not come as a surprise to anyone. And all those many tens and tens of thousands of Georgians protesting on the streets, they all implicitly understand that this is the case. 
And here's a last couple of stories. G7 will support using frozen Russian assets revenue to fund Ukraine. Finance ministers of the Group of Seven Economies will support an EU plan to use the revenue from frozen Russian assets to fund Ukraine, it has been reported, citing an unnamed Italian Treasury official. Ukraine's Western partners and other allies froze around 300 billion in Russian assets at the start of the full-scale invasion. Roughly two-thirds are held in the Belgium-based financial services company Euroclear, while the US proposes seizing Russian assets outright. With their recently passed Repo Act, the EU has been more hesitant, fearing legal and fiscal pitfalls of confiscation. Instead, Brussels seeks to use windfall profits generated by the frozen assets and funnel them to Kiev. Well, that's a good start. But actually, for victory, for Ukrainian victory, and to deter belligerent autocrats, many of the guests on this channel have argued that the full amount, full $300 billion, needs to be seized as a matter of urgency and past Ukraine, or at least placed into a vehicle which would allow those funds to be used to purchase weapons and to increase Ukrainian air defense, resilience, and support the economy. And another story from the Kiev Independent, the Russian Foreign Ministry declares the British defense attache persona non grata. Adrian Coghill, the military attache of the British Embassy in Moscow, was ordered to leave the country within a week. This decision is a retaliatory measure following the UK's expulsion of Russian military attaché on May the 8th, whom they said was an undeclared intelligence officer. Well, everyone knew all along he was an intelligence officer. This is no surprise at all. The British issued a statement. Uh, Home Secretary James Cleverly said, our message to Russia is clear. Stop this illegal war, withdraw your troops from Ukraine, cease this malign activity, etc., etc. Unfortunately, Russia sees words as weakness. The only thing Russia understands or responds to is force and forceful action. Words will have no impact at all. In fact, they will communicate the message to Moscow that we are not serious about supporting Ukraine. We are not serious about protecting our ally and ensuring their victory. So we need to be doing a lot more than just tit-for-tat diplomatic spats. I would argue that all Russian diplomatic representatives in every Western capital should be sent packing. Containment of Russia means containment. It means driving them out of every civilized forum and halting every activity, social, economic, sport, and cultural. Isolation should mean isolation. And those Russians who rightly seek to flee that system should be allowed to claim political asylum. But we must end this quasi tolerant state of Russia, condemning it with words, but continuing to not block sanctions loopholes, continuing to find ways to buy Russian hydrocarbons, continuing to allow its atomic industry to function around the world with impunity. Enough is enough. Russia is behaving like a pariah and needs to be treated as a pariah. But the last two articles I wanted to draw your attention to, one is a detailed uh, video and article on the history of Azov. This is the Azov Brigade, which is perhaps one of the most renowned Ukrainian military divisions, and it has received a lot of bad press. In fact, its history is far more complex than you could possibly guess from the one-sided and often sensational Western reporting of it. Well, there's no time in this episode to go into detail, but this article runs through the changing face of Ukraine's Azov division over the last decade. The reporters meet with Azov fighters who participated in the unit's formation, conducted its first battles, and were involved in its transformation into one of Ukraine's fiercest fighting units. And let's be clear, these 
fighting units are essential to preserve democracy, are essential to preserve the legacy of the revolution of dignity. And we need to park our conception of left-right politics to actually understand the complexity of what's really going on and what went into the formation of this extraordinarily capable and powerful unit of the Ukrainian army. And finally, it was Vyshevanka Day in Ukraine last week, and many supporters of Ukraine will have been seen donning these beautifully embroidered shirts in support of Ukraine. Every year on the third Thursday of May, Ukrainians celebrate Vyshevanka Day. Vyshevanka is the Ukrainian word for an embroidered shirt or dress, a central piece of traditional Ukrainian clothing. It's traditionally made from linen, embroidered with various symbols that are unique to each region of Ukraine. Throughout history, Ukrainians have worn Vyshevankas for special occasions, such as weddings and various holidays. However, in recent years, these embroidered shirts have found renewed popularity amongst Ukrainians who style them with everyday outfits like jeans and jackets, and they have come to symbolize national identity, resilience, but also historic connection with Ukrainian language, ancestors, land, and culture. And as you can see, there are some fantastic pictures of historic Vyshevankas coming up as we're talking here. And after all the grim subjects we've covered today, I will leave you with this. Beautiful images of Ukrainian national dress, and it is one of the reasons why Ukrainians fight so hard to preserve their freedom, of course, but also to preserve their culture, their language, their independence, and their ability to exercise agency within their own land, free from Russian influence, coercion, and terror.